Good morning. He's back. The he I'm referring to is King David. After a stretch of was so long of 13 or 14 studies in a row of psalms written by King David, we had a couple of short breaks as we looked at several psalms not written by David. But this morning, as we return to Psalm number 69, we're back to King David for one, and then we move away again. As we read number 69 this morning, you'll probably pick up on some themes, some ideas that we've heard elsewhere in David. You'll also maybe pick up on some echoes of things that we've heard elsewhere in the Old Testament if you've been doing your Bible reading in recent months or years. And you'll also pick up, I think, on some very distant hints of things to come that point to greater realities than just David's own particular situation. It's a longer psalm, so we'll read all of it. But for the sake of time, what we'll do, rather than going through and commenting on every verse by verse, we'll look at just a handful to kind of make my point about how this psalm ties together some Old Testament ideas and some New Testament realities. So let's go ahead and start in Psalm number 69, verse 1. Read along, if you will. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters, and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting on for my God. More in number than the hairs on my head are those who hate me without cause. Mighty are those who would destroy me, those who attack me with lies. What I did not steal must I now restore. O oh God, you know my folly. The wrongs that I have done are not hidden from you. Let not those who put hope in you be put to shame through me, O Lord, God of hosts. Let not those who seek you to be brought to dishonor through me, O God of Israel. For it is for your sake that I have borne reproach. That dishonor has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons. For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When I wept and humbled my soul with fasting, it became my reproach. When I made sackcloth my clothing, I became a byword to them. I am the talk of those who sit in the gate, and the drunkards make songs about me. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord. At an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me in your saving faithfulness. Deliver me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me, or the deep swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. Hide not your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Make haste to answer me. Draw near to my soul, redeem me, ransom me because of my enemies. You know my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. My foes are all known to you. Reproaches have broken my heart, so that I am in despair. I looked for pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. Let their own table before them become a snare, and when they are at peace, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see, and make their loins tremble continually." Pour out your indignation upon them, and let your burning anger overtake them. May their camp be a desolation. Let no one dwell in their tents. For they persecute whom, him whom they have struck down. They recount the pain of those you have wounded. Add to them punishment upon punishment. May they have no acquittal from you. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. But I am afflicted and in pain. Let your salvation, O God, set me on high. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hoofs. When the humble see it, they will be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. For the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own people who are prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build up the cities of Judah, and people shall dwell there and possess it. The offspring of his servants shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. 
And so a lot of stuff going on here in Psalm 69, some that we've heard elsewhere, some that might remind you of other Psalms we've already read, David picking up ideas and themes from other writings, some maybe even picking up from other books, books that perhaps came after this, and the imagery that they talk about is imagery they borrowed from Psalms like Psalm 69. For example, it's a common theme in the Psalms, as well as the book of Jonah, to speak of trouble and judgment being like water, raging water, chaos, it comes up and swim, swims over us. For the waters have come up to my neck, he says. I'm deep in the mire. I have no foothold. I'm in the deep waters. The floods sweep over me. A little later, he talks about the water theme again. And so there's plenty of that. But throughout it are other ideas, other images that I believe point to the coming Messiah as well. David's own son, the kid from his own loins, the king who would one day sit on the throne of David forever. Let's just look at a few for the sake of time. For example, look at verse 3. I'm weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. Remember, when Jesus was on the cross. He uttered seven words, seven sayings, seven statements, one of which was, I thirst. My throat is parched, he says. Now, scroll down the page or look down the page to verse 21. They gave me poison for food. That's not the connection. But look at verse 21, the second part. And for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. Remember when Jesus cried out, I thirst, they lifted up to him a sponge, not with water on it, though there surely would have been water available. They lifted up to him a sponge with sour wine, gall, sometimes the old King James referred to it. They essentially lifted up to him vinegar. And so rather than comforting him in his agony and his thirst, they only made it worse by giving him something that could never help him. Look at verse 8. I have become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons. Remember the story when Jesus and his disciples were in the house and he was teaching, and a knock came at the door, and one of the disciples went and answered it, and they came back and said, Rabbi, your mother and your brothers are at the door. And Jesus' answer is, Who are my mothers and brothers but those who are with me, who follow my teachings, who obey my commands? The occasion was that Mary and Jesus' brothers, because of his teaching, thought he had lost his mind and came to take him home. He became a stranger in aliens. Or verse 9, For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Now, while we're going through the Gospel of Mark on Sunday mornings, we're skipping some stories. Because Mark chose to leave them out so he could get to the points that emphasize what he's trying to build on. But, for example, Matthew and Luke tell us the same story at the beginning of Jesus' time in ministry. He's baptized. He came up out of the water. God pronounces him his beloved son, with whom he's well pleased. All three accounts have him going into the wilderness for the temptation. But whereas Mark takes Jesus immediately to Galilee after coming out of the wilderness, Matthew and Luke take him immediately to Jerusalem, where he goes to the temple. He clears out the money changers and all the prophet mongers who are there taking advantage of the pilgrims. Because... Zeal for his house has consumed me. And the reproaches of those who reproach you, those who hate you, hate me because of it. When Jesus cleared the temple, they asked him, by whose authority do you use such things? And his response was, you will not turn my father's house into a den of thieves. Verse 26 of Psalm 69. For they persecute me or persecute him, whom you have struck down, and they recount the pain of those you have wounded. Now you may go, I don't think of a single verse in the New Testament quite sounds that way. But remember, Psalm number 69 might also be pointing to other things that come later. For example, Isaiah 53, the so-called suffering servant passage, describes the response of the people who look on and watch the suffering servant suffer, smitten by God, struck down by him, and wag their heads in disbelief. David predicted that here in Psalm 69, verse 26. You also remember in this psalm, there was a passage as we were reading through it, where David talks about, don't let me be stuck, don't let me be drowned and lost in the waters. But he also says in verse 15, don't let the water sweep over me, don't let the water swallow me, or don't let the pit, the tomb, close its mouth over me. The image is, if I die, don't let it keep me. Don't leave me in. In other words, resurrect me. And then finally, at the end of the prayer, he's already prayed that God would not hold others accountable because of his punishment. But at the end of his prayer, 
he says this about it all. He says, beginning there in verse 33, tying it all together. For the Lord hears the needy, and he does not despise his own people who are prisoners. He doesn't hold it against them. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion, the city of God, and he'll build up the cities of Judah, and people shall dwell there and possess it. Now, this could be foreshadowing the coming exiles that are going to take place a little later in the Old Testament, and certainly that would fit the description. But I want you to focus one more moment on verse 36. The offspring of his servants, the descendants of those who serve him and follow him, they shall inherit it. They shall inherit the land, and those who love his name, God's name, shall dwell in it. The promise is that God's people will one day claim God's land and live there in his presence forever. That's the psalm pointing us to a future reality, a blessed hope not only hinted at and partially fulfilled in the exiles, but completely realized in the coming of the Messiah, the one who was mocked, the one who was killed, the one who was raised from the dead, and the one who sets the captives free and brings them one day, just as he promised, into his father's house. May the words of David increase your hope. And may the words of the Lord bring you satisfaction as you look forward to the day of their fulfillment.